Config. So I'm Diana Mounter. I am head of design at GitHub, and you can find me on the internet as Broccolini. And I'm Neha Batra, VP of Engineering at GitHub, and you can find me on the internet as Nerd Neha. So I am going to get right into it. Back in 2020, an unforgettable year for many reasons. About a year before I stepped into my current role as head of design, my former boss shared an article with me called Trapped in a Values Oasis. I was leading design infrastructure at the time, which included our design systems team. The article describes the pitfalls of leading with influence versus authority, and that modeling new approaches is often an effective way to influence an organization to adopt your values. However, when done in the wrong situation, it can create a misalignment of values within an organization, leading to a great deal of conflict. The authors called these pockets of values misalignment a values oasis. It took me a while for the story behind the article to sink in, and that, but it, later in 2020, I realized that my team was in danger of being trapped in a values oasis. I think this is particularly relevant to design systems teams. Design systems teams are often charged with influencing change in how we develop user interfaces. As a bridge between design and code, design systems teams often firsthand feel that friction between different cultural values that exist in an organization. And in many cases, organizations struggle with where to put design systems teams. Um, how to structure them, and whether they should be design-led or engineering-led. So I led GitHub's design systems team called Primer for six years um, before stepping into leading the design org as head of design. And Neha led engineering teams at GitHub for about six and a half years, including more than half of that using Primer within her teams, before she took over leading Primer Engineering last year. And together, we are going to share the journey of design systems at GitHub and avoiding the values oasis. So we started building design systems um, in around 2016. Primer was more of a CSS framework than what we might call a design system at the time. I and several other designers who had joined around the same time and who had worked on design systems in other companies um, so lots of improvements and potential for Primer. So GitHub tends to attract designers that um, can code. Um, it's often because they also use GitHub. And when I joined, product designers and web designers contributed to production code and often assisted in implementing designs. Um, this is a photo from when some of, uh, some of that early team first met in Austin um, for the first time. Some designers um, would get deeper in the stack, but pretty much every designer at that time when we hired were required to write at least some CSS and, and be comfortable with front end. So this meant that designers were often the ones that were feeling the pain points of Primer and our CSS infrastructure. Engineering, on the other hand, tended to hire full stack engineers, um, meaning that front of the front end skills like CSS weren't always necessarily a core skill. Design polish and UI bug fixes were often taken on by designers, giving designers the feeling that they were, had responsibility for that work over engineers. For engineering, there wasn't much of an incentive to use or create a centralized component system. Their tasks were more based on features and not necessarily the holistic user experience. There was also a lot of tenured people in the company, particularly in engineering, that hadn't been exposed to component libraries and newer, newer approaches to CSS architecture at the time. They simply didn't realize that perhaps there could be a better way. 
So for those reasons, our design systems team started within the design org. So key that design systems montage when we've got our first full-time team members, we're shipping releases upon releases, people are contributing, um, we're reducing design bottlenecks, engineering are using the system, we hired our first engineer with an engineering title, um, they're somewhere in this photo behind me. Um, we're increasing UX consistency, making stuff responsive, because you probably should have already been responsive at that point. Um, we had more people, some of which are in this uh, photo behind me. We started expanding our system from CSS to Rails components and React components. And in early 2020, we shipped one of the most significant redesigns for GitHub that we'd seen in about five years, making us look current again. So that very quickly skipped over about four years of design systems work, taking us to 2020, when we had some even bigger ships. So following that redesign that I just mentioned, we did a big refactor and first refactor, there were many more to come, if you speak to some of the team, of our, our color system. And then we shipped dark mode. Um, this is a GIF from the promotional launch video that has GitHub UI coming out of an iodized bath. That's how much of a big deal it was. So for us, it was, a, it was a pretty big effort. There was years of work, really, in it, to be able to make that happen. But it was also about one of the best things that we could have done to, to increase adoption of our design system. Dark mode was really popular, and it also very clearly shows you when things are not you know, using the system properly. You can visually see it in many cases. And when it's something that is so popular with customers, of course, product teams want their stuff to look really great in dark mode as well. So that got Primus and fans and us as a team a bit more attention. This is when I started to realize that we worked a little bit differently. Um, this was the first time that the design systems team had been responsible for a ship at Universe, which is our annual um, conference at GitHub. It was kind of a big deal. Um, it meant that we went through all sorts of new processes and checks to make sure that uh, dark mode was ready for that launch. We couldn't um, really test it with customers much because it needed to be a secret and that one more thing kind of unveil. Um, we had to contribute to like blog posts and press kits and things like that. It was a lot of new things that we hadn't usually been exposed to, whereas product teams had often been through these processes. Also during 2020, we had started to make progress on our React component library. Improvements to our CSS infrastructure had gotten us far, but um, it wasn't really enough to deliver at the scale we wanted. And so like many companies, we turned to React components with encapsulated styles as a solution. In early 2021, we saw our first production app go live built with React using that Primer React component library. It felt like a huge win and a big endorsement for Primer React. Unfortunately, though, we still had much of GitHub built with our original CSS library, and we had other parts built with our Rails solution for components as well. And so then we added this new component library built in React, and things weren't really tied, tied together at the base layer, and then we had a production application using it and a, and a fast moving team working on it. And so at that moment, it felt like Primer kind of graduated from something that was very much a design owned uh, responsibility to becoming a more essential part of our front end infrastructure. And we needed engineering to be really familiar with it. So quickly, the stakes were raised. Both dark modes and React components shipping in production felt like big successes, but with that came more interest in what our team was doing and more pressure by the expectations and dependencies on product teams. This is when I really started to notice friction in the way that we worked compared to other teams. We were assigned a PM on the tail end of dark mode, and while I'd been asking for a PM for a while and really wanted to work with product, um, it was the first time working with them, and I discovered that there were different expectations, processes, ways of working that I just wasn't familiar with. 
And then, following that, a reorg was announced. And I discovered that our team needed to partner with a new engineering team that were charged with building our new React infrastructure. We couldn't you know, build our React components without aligning with what the engineering team, they needed to be compatible with each other. So around this time, I reflected on that article that my boss had sent me about the Valleys Oasis. And I started to see past the mirage of the world we had been working with. We had been in charge of our own roadmap for years. We had the skills within our team to meet our own deliverables because we had designers, we had engineers, and I acted as a one woman like engineering product and design lead. So we had a lot of autonomy. We could move fast, make decisions quickly, and execute on them. And it felt good. It felt like we were making progress. But we had been falling away from how the rest of the org worked. And my boss and I had, quite frankly, let the team stay in this oasis uh, for too long. So ultimately, the misalignment started to affect our ability to have successful impact. So meanwhile in engineering, Meanwhile in engineering, so uh, in 2021, I led an engineering team called Communities, and that's essentially what we used to bring together what tools we could build for the open source community with respect to consumers, contributors, and maintainers. And so this was super exciting, and one of the features that we were building, which is canon now, but wasn't back in the day, uh, was that discussions tab, right? And so uh, back in the day before that happened, uh, you would go into the issues backlog and you'd see the list, and you would see the work that you wanted to do and the bugs that you wanted to fix, but you'd also have questions and answered, questions and answers, feedback, and you would have ideas. And so we were essentially having conversations where we were trying to do the work. And so the whole goal was to say we should have conversations alongside our work, but maybe not inside of the backlog. Now, if you think about how we're going to build this, uh, we obviously wanted to reuse a lot of the components from our issues and our PRs tab, right? Uh, because it makes sense, that's what's familiar to you all, and we wanted to make sure that that felt like home. But at the same time, the question is, what do you do on the code base side, right? For engineering, uh, we wanted to extend the code base on the issues and PR side, but that is some of the oldest code we have in our code base. So what are we gonna do? Are we gonna build it, or are we gonna extend it, or are we gonna try to go from scratch? Simultaneously, I'd seen design systems at other company and I'd, I had invested in them. I was excited to see the development of Primer and I strongly advocated for its adoption in my team. But then we were bumping into some issues, right? We were rebuilding old components while the design system team was working on how they wanted to develop uh, and how they wanted to uh, be consistent with the engineering team overall. And so we had run into a few issues with Primer. And uh, just to take a step back, really to be really clear here, when you run into issues, it's often because you have conflicting pressures. So for us, we were receiving pressure from our users who are really excited about this feature that had gone into public beta, and they wanted a GA, right? And they wanted to know when everyone could access it. And also, you know, from leadership, we were in this growth phase of the company, and we needed to ship and move forward, and we need to show that velocity to our users. And in turn, right, we were applying that pressure to the design systems team because they were um, building new patterns that, or we were building new patterns that they weren't yet supporting. And so there was some of that conflict, right? And so this is a fundamental question, right? What's it gonna be, velocity or consistency? And this is pretty typical. You're always gonna see this experience in this conflict. Um, and so we tried to understand the roadmap and how they pr prioritized, how they contributed. And I was left feeling a little unclear However, we were able to work through it, right? So with office hours from their side, with the passion and interest for us to work against both sides, and with Diana and I honestly having conversations about how we wanted to collaborate, we were able to make progress without straying too far away from the system. So cheers to good collaboration. But then, <laughs> there was a little bit more pressure. So later that year, GitHub publicly announced their goals for accessibility and their vision for the program. And here on screen is an image from a video series that GitHub created about developers with dis disabilities. This is Anton, who has cere cerebral palsy, and he sat at his desk next to a window writing code using assistive technologies. So, if you think about it, right, we had this brand new program that we wanted to um, launch, and of all the areas that we wanted to invest in, discussions was one of the most important areas. This is already an area where we're trying to lower the barrier and make our repos more accessible to the real world, and so this is an area that we wanted to invest in as well. So there were some bugs, obviously, in the system that design systems had to um, 
had to integrate into and that blocked us from delivering our goals. Same conflict again, right? We were met with that challenging choice. Do we fix accessibility issues in our own feed? feature? Do we upstream to help the platform? Or do we wait for upstream improvements from Primer? And like, honestly, to be clear, this is a great problem for us to have. At least we can upstream changes into the platform. But as you might remember from those pressures and the stage that we were in our company, it was really hard for us to just wait around for those changes. So I had a lot of empathy for the design systems team because it was clear from the outside that there was pressure not just from us but from other areas on the design systems and that they were struggling to meet those demands. Um, but you know, both Diana and I had the support of the CEO and the head of design. There were our executive sponsors, head of design was Diana's manager, and we were able to resolve a lot of that pressure um, and they gave us a natural touch point, right? We were able to have these natural conversations for us to figure out how we're gonna continue to collaborate. We had a plan, right? And the thing about plans is, they're the plan until it's not. So black screen, right? Record scratch. Uh, not long after we made this announcement, the head of design left and we got a new CEO. And so of course things had to change. We didn't have those natural touch points as we had relied on before. And so I had to rely on my relationship with Diana to figure out how we we're gonna get stuff done. So in November 2021, with my boss leaving, I was offered to step into his role as and lead the org as head of design. But with the CEO leaving, there was quite a big uh, leadership landscape shift. It really had changed quite a lot. I found myself working with new peers who had different expectations from the previous leadership, and I'd lost the protection of my former boss and his influence. I found myself doubting previously successful approaches, feeling unsure if principles I had thought were core to GitHub's now stay true, and which advice I could trust. Like coming out of a lush oasis into a dry desert, I felt like everything was in hard mode. So the other thing though was that moving into this role um, gave me a new perspective as well as new responsibilities. I wanted to be a leader who was visible and who had influence, but also ensure my team as a whole had recognition and visibility. With all design teams becoming my responsibility now, not just design infrastructure, I took more serious steps to reduce the friction and values misalignment with how our teams worked. When hiring my new design director and uh, uh, engineering leader for design infrastructure, I talked with them both about the pros and cons of having design system reporting into design. I shared that you know, we needed to have engineering representation and we, at the senior leadership level, but I was that, so it wasn't ideal. And we, while we did have a, um, some PM support with the new goals and accessibility, that really drew a lot of attention. And so the large amount of the responsibility really fell on our shoulders to develop roadmaps, plan and coordinate with other teams. So to help, I try to encourage my new leads to build strong relationships with other org partners, particularly in engineering and product, and encourage them to adopt um, org-wide practices such as product release processes and engineering practices um, things like how we hired and onboarded engineers and setting the same expectations around things like promotions. But despite that, despite trying to reduce in, uh, the gap between the different ways of working, um, we still had a lot of pressure on the team. We were servicing three variations of that design system and had a lot of work to do to really connect them at the foundation still. Engineering also announced a long-term move to use React on the front end, and Primer was still really lacking maturity, lacking a lot of um, coverage and robust tooling to support it. And GitHub had a much larger surface area than when we had started back in 2016. Um, it had much wider adoption, and there were more and more people using the system, and more and more asked for new patterns and coverage. And with our accessibility vision, Primer was in the direct path of being able to both deliver and maintain um, accessibility goals for the long term. Increasingly, it felt like we needed to make bigger changes. Then, in 2022, with serious world events happening, 
GitHub, like many companies, felt the impact of economic headwinds. That made it feel like asking for eng headcount when in a design team, when we were unfortunately making cuts, it just really felt like an impossible ask. We had hundreds of engineers versus tens of designers. What we really wanted to do is leverage those existing engineers, um, not hire new ones. Um, and doing that, trying to do that across organizational lines felt really difficult. It hindered our ability to augment resources from the existing much larger engineering team towards Primer. So that's when I started a conversation with Neha about how to set Primer on the best path for success. So when Diana came to me about moving Primer Engineering to my org, it felt like all arrows were already pointing in that direction and there was some momentum there. So I wasn't completely surprised. I was now leading the org that included our front-end engineering teams and teams that worked really closely with Primer Engineering already, including some of those that had a lot of cross-dependencies. And so prior to this, right, on top of that, Diana and I had already had discussions about the future funding of Primer, the best place it should come from. And so that was also another reason why it wasn't a surprise when Diana had approached our team. The timing was pretty good, right? I had time to settle into my new role, and I had the capacity to take on new responsibilities. I knew that in my org, we had engineers with similar skill sets to design systems so that we could augment that, right, in those teams and make sure that we're collaborating with or directly working on Primer. Um, and then finally, we already had some positive examples of collaboration, right? And that made the change make more sense. And so uh, at GitHub, we have this phrase, uh, the pendulum swingeth. Everyone kind of uses the phrase a little bit differently. Um, basically, what that means is that sometimes we move from one extreme to the other. And if you've ever been at a company long enough, right, you're going to see us make changes and then reverse them and go back to the other extremes. And that's always gonna happen, right? It's good to make big changes when all the arrows are pointing to one direction um, because you want folks to react to that change and say, oh yeah, that makes sense, or I was hoping that would happen. Maybe not everyone's going to feel that way, but it should at least not come as a complete surprise. And so in this case, we were able to move with the pendulum swing and swing in the same direction with respect to the problems to solve, skills to receive the team, and openness to change. So. As you can tell from our collective experience, if you find yourself in a values oasis, all is not lost. So we wanted to codify some of the lessons that we learned here, um, and this is what we've taken away. So I really strongly encourage you to build teams that will last when you're gone. Make sure they are resilient to change. If you leave and everything else falls down around you, you're not really leaving a good legacy. Make connections across organizational lines, don't work in silos. You, know, you never know, Those, the connections that you make, um, they could become your greatest ally in future, like Neha and I. Don't lose the goodness from before. If you're gonna make big changes, it should mean that you don't wanna change everything. If you think about it, we're trying to merge the two cultures and merge the changes, not a force push where you get YOLO and you just completely ignore all of the conflicts that you had before, right? We wanted to decrease the coordination that we had, but we wanted to keep that closeness between the design systems team and design, right? And so, before any change, you wanna take stock of what you want to preserve and then use that so that those can be the good foundation for you to establish your new culture and how you want to work together. So like in software development, um, we have to have some git puns in here, I'm afraid, sorry <laughs> folks. Um, the longer you've been working in a branch without pulling updates from main, the more conflicts you're probably going to experience when you try to merge that branch back in. AKA, the longer you exist in a values oasis, the harder it is to get out of it. Keep your eyes on the prize, right? Imagine, right, it's not just us versus them, it's not about empire building, it's about the opportunity, right? And that opportunity ahead of us is going to be what is going to carry you through and help you make those decisions. Leaders are measured on impact, not on org size or structure. And in our case, the opportunities that we had ahead of us were that we wanted a design system that enable, enables us to be efficient, we wanted to deliver a great customer experience that's accessible, and we wanted to pre keep our brand quality bar high, right? And sometimes that's gonna mean that you need to work on management structures, especially as leaders. That is how we're going to set our teams up for success. It's necessary work, it's not office politics, it's the job, um, and it's all part of working with people. So watch out for that pendulum swing and try to move with it. 
You can either take control um, of the outcome and make decisions or risk having made those decisions be made for you. When Nehar and I saw change coming, we leaned into it. We worked together and we were able to influence the outcome. And that leads to our next point, right? Embracing change. Change can feel hard, but it's part of life. It's certainly part of what makes tech tech, right? And it keeps things exciting. So each change is going to create these new opportunities. And just like what we listed before, we focus on those opportunities uh, instead of uh, the difficulties ahead. It kind of helps you pair the two together. So well, my final point is that design systems really need to be a shared responsibility between engineering, product, and design. If it's not obvious, you need that engineering buying because they're using the system too, they're building with it, and you need that representation in the engineering teams as well. You need product buying because, I mean, they are often the ones that are making decisions about are we gonna meet this deadline to ship this new feature, um, what do we do about um, competing um, goals, like accessibility goals like we talked about earlier, and using the system and making sure that we don't accrue tech debt. So in our case, uh, an organizational change ended up being important for us to be able to solve some of those problems, but that alone won't solve uh, your team from getting trapped in a value with Oasis. So we made uh, an org change, and we started a new branch, but we need to make sure we update that branch with main. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves in a design, you know, values oasis again. So there's a million ways to build teams, build design systems, and, uh, and structure your org. There's hundreds of correct paths, right? But what's important is that together we decided the outcome that would be successful for GitHub, for our situation at that time. And it was just a matter of solving the best path given the constraints that we had. Try to approach points of friction with curiosity. Lead through that ambiguity and advocate for disagreement. Advocate through disagreement, not for disagreement. That's not the <laughs> <a good> idea. <laughs> I think the fact that we are both here on stage talking about this together today is because we have invested in a foundation of trust. So thanks for having us, Convig.